Please welcome Nikki Bergman of the Richardson Center for Global Engagement. Her Excellency Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic of the Republic of Croatia and His Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nikki Bergman. I'm Vice President and Executive Director of Governor Richardson's uh, Center for Global Engagement. We're a small NGO, a non-for-profit organization that works in crisis theaters around the world with a focus on negotiating the release of uh, disputed prisoners in places like North Korea, Myanmar, Venezuela, and Russia. Um, and as we uh, engage in this, I, I want to kind of take a moment and ask everybody here, we often, when we disagree, when we see something happens in the world and disagree with leaders, we, we often just cast them as irrational and crazy. Um, and truth is, very rarely uh, people are irrational. It's just that we fail to understand everything that goes into their calculation and how they look at the world. So for the next 25 minutes, I would like everybody to try, and it's hard, to suspend judgment on good and evil and everything that we feel, feel personally very passionate about what's happening and use this time to try and understand a little bit more what we can about President Putin, the way he thinks about himself, the way he sees the world, um, because I believe that if we do that well, we can come out of it with a better understanding of what is possible and what is not possible. And I could not think of two people better than the ones we have in order to actually engage us and give us that uh, insight. Um, and let me start with uh, Her Excellency, uh, President Kolinda Grabar Kitarovic. Um, uh, she is the former president of the Republic of Croatia, uh, years of 2015 to 2020. Uh, before that, she served as the foreign minister of Croatia and ambassador to the US, Mexico, Panama, and the Organization of American States. In 2020, she was elected as independent member of the International Olympic uh, Committee. Madam President, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you. And of course, His Excellency uh, Jose Manuel uh, uh, Barroso, uh, who is the former president of the European Commission for the years of 20, 2004 to 2014. In that tenure, he also accepted the Nobel Peace Prize in 2012 uh, for the work that the uh, European Commission has done under his leadership those years. Uh, prior to that, um, uh, he served as the, president, uh, the Prime Minister of Portugal in 2002. So thank you, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. And let's just jump straight into it because I think it's, uh, 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 we want to make sure we cover as much as we can. You have met individually, you have met Putin many times. I believe your count is about 25 times. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and at very historical junctures in history, like this is a very important moment. Uh, can you start by telling us a little bit of uh, maybe an anecdote or a little story of meeting Putin, how he is in person, um, uh, how his conduct, his mannerism, things like that that can tell us a little bit. And let's start with you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Mike. So first of all, delighted to be here with you and with my good friend Colinda and uh, here in Concordia. Um, in fact, I'm not especially proud of it, but I met President Putin 25 times, according to my cabinet. He was, in fact, the leader outside European Union that they met the most because at that time, in European Union, we had twice a year a summit with Russia. And I also met him in bilateral meetings in the margins of the G8. At that time, Russia was a member of G8 and the G20. But if you ask me a story, it was not a, per a meeting in person, but a phone call. It was when it started the invasion of, of Crimea in 2014, I called Putin. We're speaking on first name basis. So Vladimir, what's happening? We see that the uh, Russians now are invading um, Crimea. And he said, no, it's not an invasion. These are some people who were around. Some of them are family members. Some of them are in holidays. And they were invited by the people back in Crimea. And so they are there. Because I can tell you one thing, Jose Manuel. If it was the Russian army, we would take Kiev in less than two weeks. That he said it in 2014. Of course, I thought this was sufficiently important to inform my colleagues of the European Council, the heads of state and the government. At that time, we were 28 members of the European Union before Brexit. And I, I told the story exactly as he told me. 
there was a leak. I'm not going to say who made the leak, but it appeared in the Italian media, <laughs> in La Repubblica, and then it was all over the media. If you Google it, you'll see Reuters at that time, all the media. Uh, the Kremlin was very angry because they said that this was a confidential conversation uh, and it was taken out of context because the media was putting it as a threat. And in fact, it did not mean it was a threat at that time. It was saying he could do that. And by the way, uh, that's the way I told my colleagues in the European Council. But they did not deny the story. They just said it was out of context, OK? So I think this is very interesting, because now, in February this year, when they invaded um, Ukraine, a full-scale invasion, I asked myself, why now and not then? And I believe, basically, because now, Putin, after Syria believes the United States and the West are weaker, after Afghanistan, I'm sorry, after Afghanistan, he believes the United States and the West are weaker. After Syria, he believes he's stronger. I also believe that he has invested a lot in his military capabilities, namely on nuclear, technical nuclear capabilities. And also, he has a greater control of the Russian society. At that time, it was still some limited pluralism. But there was some pluralism in Russia. Today, it's a complete autocratic system with the leader of the opposition, as you know, in prison. So these are, and by, by the way, and because of the energy prices, even before the latest developments, he was able to build a very strong war chest that was enabling him, the huge balance of payment surplus, that enabled him to, to go more or less confidently in this, uh, this, this war, that from my point of view, but I don't want to anticipate the points we are going to discuss, but for me it was a complete strategic mistake. I do not agree that uh, Putin is a brilliant strategist. I do not agree. I met him many, many times, as you know. I think he's someone who decides, yes, rational in the sense that he analyzes cost benefits. He tries, he's an opportunistic person. He tries to go until when, he, where he thinks he can go, but he's cautious. It's not a kind of a, but then he made a complete mistake because he did not, I'm sure he did make the mistake of, he did not, would not expect the reaction of the Ukrainian people but also the reaction of the West, yeah. United States and Europe. It was not expecting this kind of reaction. Yeah, and we'll get back to that uh, on the moment of how he calculates and how he sees the weakness and strength in, in a little bit. But, uh, Madame President, can you share a little bit of a, of a, his, of a story with Putin? Uh, yes, absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. I did not meet President Putin quite as many times as José Manuel, uh, but I did have uh, opportunities to actually speak to him or spend time with him for hours, spanning from 2007 to our last meeting in 2020, which was relatively brief. So in 2007, I was Minister of Foreign Affairs of Croatia, uh, and uh, I will focus a little bit more on 2017 uh, when I came to Russia as President of Croatia to primarily take care of our bilateral uh, issues. But since you want it for us to be a little bit personal, let me tell you a few stories that illustrate himself, the kind of man he is and his character. So I must say that he was never ever disrespectful to me, even when we disagreed. But if you show him disrespect, he will show it back. And I witnessed that in 2007 when, when I was foreign minister. And when one of our high officials, I will not name the person, use the opportunity, a very undiplomatic move, I must say, to keep the cameras and lecture Putin for 15 minutes on one of our neighboring countries and let the cameras go. So the meeting was over. I was looking at his face and his body language. He did not react much. But when we came to dinner, he was seated next to that person. I was seated next to him. He sat in a way that he turned his chair completely away from the person and for the next three hours spent talking to me. And I did not want to go into state business at the time. We talked mostly about the world, about sports, etc. Uh, in 2017, when I came to Russia as president, we had a lot of problems, a lot of bilateral issues with Russia that we had to take care of. And one of them was um, Agrocor company that was majority owned by Sberbank. And, uh, um, there was a, a breakdown in the communications, so when, that was one of the top things on the agenda. 
So I decided to go to Sochi rather than to Moscow. And by that time, they knew that already I had been NATO Assistant Secretary General, that I had been to Yushchenko's inauguration, that I was in Ukraine in 2014 at the Kiev Security Summit and made strong statements in support of Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. And they did not even dispute that. They um, accepted that I w will make those statements public. But you, what, what you have to keep in mind is when you come to talk to Putin and Russians in general, you have to come really well prepared. You cannot improvise. Uh, they will disrespect you for your lack of knowledge. Although they themselves might not be the best informed party, which I realized that in 2017 when we discussed Agrocor. Through our conversations that lasted for about four hours, I realized it was complete, he had been completely misinformed uh, that the company had been uh, nationalized by Croatia, etc. So he was willing to accept my arguments. And he told me that actually the president and the CEO of Sberbank had come on the same plane to him uh, to Sochi and that he asked to have uh, the floor at lunch, etc. But, you know, Putin told me, okay, I'm going to give him two minutes and that was it. So I, I will not tell of the detail of the, of the conversation. But they ultimately did accept the arguments and everybody sat around the same table and we were able to resolve uh, an issue that was of national importance for our economy, but for the neighboring countries as well. And he did keep his promises at the time, which, um, you know, makes me quite convinced that prior to the uh, February 24th open attack against Ukraine, he probably had been misinformed by people around him. I have been president of a country with much less consequential role than he had. But still, you know, people around me would serve me the kind of information that benefited them. Nobody wanted to carry the bad news. Uh, they also presented the information in the way that things wanted to go. So on the one hand, I believe that he did not have full information. And also, I believe, I agree with Jose Manuel that he made huge miscalculations when invading Ukraine openly. First of all, they very much neglected the fact that Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation have um, really, uh, they have that sense of unity and the sense of a national belonging. Uh, he, uh, they had underestimated the Ukrainian uh, spirit and the will to fight when you defend your own country. Uh, they underestimated the fact that Ukrainian forces are not the same as back in 2014. They have been trained and equipped, uh, among other, by uh, NATO uh, member nations. And uh, third, they underestimated uh, th our own response. The speed and the depth, uh, if you compare it back to 2014, it was completely different. And that is, I think, definitely something that he was not counting on. But, you know, just to, to, to wrap it up, I said he was never disrespectful. We used to disagree a lot, especially on energy, not as much on NATO enlargement, although he said that he would not allow it uh, in our neighborhood. But we disagreed a lot on energy, but he was never late. I had been told that, yes, the meeting would start late, but they would let me know when, the, uh, when I should leave my hotel. And he was waiting out there on the porch with a bouquet of flowers, the same in Moscow, which was an entirely different situation because it was the World Cup. So it was kind of a follow-up, but the kind of situation where you can have an insight into a person's uh, personality, but not really political style. Thank you. And so Putin is, is a well-known chess player, not checkers. Um, and so taking your experiences and what you shared with us with him, um, can you try and articulate, if you were him, if you're getting into his shoes, what is his objective? Why is he doing what he's doing? Is Ukraine the full board of the game? Or are we looking at a different game in which Ukraine is one Look, move? Um, I think Putin has never intellectually and even emotionally accepted the very existence of Ukraine. In one of our many meetings, and that was in Moscow, 
when I was after the Orange Revolution, when I was dis we were discussing some issues, there was we had twice energy crisis during my mandates with with Putin, and he was saying, "Why are you always defending Ukraine? You know very well that Ukraine is an artificial creation by the CIA and the European Commission." <laughs> I told him, look, if it was a creation of the European Commission, I should have known. <laughs> I don't, I, frankly, it's not the case. And he said it on record. We had several collaborators taking notes. So for me, Putin is essentially a product of resentment. And he's sincere about that resentment. Um, we discuss issues of history many, many times in the different summits from Moscow to Sochi to Katimansis to, to Yekaterinburg. When he, Yekaterinburg, he told me about the, that the civilization, uh, Indo-European civilization was born there. And it was originally Russian. So we deep, deep nationalistic. Yeah. So I think what Putin wants is to make Russia great again, <laughs> basically. Yeah. And Russia was, during the Cold War, the only challenger to the American pres uh, forces, a strong leadership. And of course, if you look at Russia and China in the last 20 years, I mean, it's a, Russia from an economic point of view is a failed state. It's the biggest country in the planet in geographical terms, but its economy, and it's the biggest exporter of energy, but its economy now is smaller than Italy and even smaller than Spain now. It's a, while in the same time, uh, China was able to be now be 10 times bigger than Russia. So it's a complete disaster. So what can Putin do? He's using the weapons he has. And what is, is still a very important military power and very important in nuclear terms and also energy as a weapon. By the way, in many meetings I had with him, in fact, it was when we were discussing energy issues that were the big clashes. Because he was discussing it in very detail about Gazprom. One day I joked with him if he was the CEO or the chairman of Gazprom. <laughs> Because, by the way, in the meetings with us, sometimes he came with the CEO uh, of Gazprom, including official meetings. So, so it's a product of resentment. He's on record, as you know, saying that the biggest tragedy of the 20th century was the fact the collapse of the Soviet Union, not because of communism, but because so many Russians stayed out of the country in other... So, as, uh, as he say, stateless, he said to me, stateless, including in the Baltic countries in, in Ukraine. And so, and he's an autocrat. Nationalist, and I don't think he's a good uh, chess player, frankly. I see, I see much more as a poker player than a chess player, mm -hmm. and made, making very risky moves yeah. and very, very risk bet, the risky bet. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And, and can you just, if I want to follow up just very, very quickly. The, can you identify what do you think the source of that resentment is for him? We're Humiliation of Russia. Okay. He, was, uh, he was educated as a nationalist person, yeah. as a Russian, which, by the way, I very much respect Russia, let's put it clear. I respect all nations, and Russia certainly has a great culture. And I consider Russia part of the European civilization. For anyone who has read Dostoevsky, or anyone who has heard Tchaikovsky, uh, it's part of the European. But there is that resentment of being left behind, not being respected. And this is very deep, I think, in Putin's mind, as Kulinda was saying. For instance, he was always respectful, but when he was reacting, he could be a bully. In many meetings, was one summit we had was, because in the European summit, it was the president of the commission at the time, myself, with the president of the council. There was a, a prime minister of Finland. He was asking very politely Putin about human rights. We always raise the issue of human rights with these countries. And he was saying, why are you asking us about human rights? Why don't you look at Italy with the mafia in Italy? And so, so it was bully. But as a reaction, not initially. So, and I think that is, um, um, is, is a difficult kind of personality. By the way, it's the kind of person my mother would not like to see me with. <laughs> it's a bully. But on a reactive way, usually does not take the initiative of doing that. And that's why I think uh, deep in his mind, he does not accept what he feels as the humiliation of Russia by by the past, and from, from the former Soviet Union now, but on nationalistic terms. Yeah. Thank you, and, and that's, uh, to me, that's such an important point and, and, and such mm. a great insight, and, and uh, Madam President, I'm going to ask you a question now, a follow-up question on that. Um, uh, uh, considering this, uh, and considering the fact that, you know, Putin is not a young, new leader, 
um, uh, where we are in his personal history or, or his lifespan, where we are in, in the, the element of this crisis, and as, as, as uh, Mr. President said, it, this is um, about basically world order more than just a, a move on, on Ukraine here, to bring back, make Russia great again. What can we expect if things, if Putin feels that things are not going his way? What can we expect to happen from his, from his perspective? And whether this conflict and this crisis now, should we expect it to be resolved or just managed through his uh, uh, rest of his uh, uh, tenure? Quite frankly, this is what's very unsettling to me because he is a very proud person. He will not, and humiliation here. Humiliation, I think, is the light motif of what, what will be happening. Uh, he is a proud person and he felt that Russia had been humiliated by the West after the end of the Cold War. Although, although uh, Lord Robertson, the former Secretary General of NATO, always quotes him in 2002 saying that the years of the Cold War had brought nothing good either for Russia or for the rest of the world. However, you know, when you speak about chess, I don't imagine him actually playing chess. I imagine my own son, who's 19 years old, who plays these um, computer games. <laughs> and one of them is, you know, you have your imaginary country and you conquer the territory around you. You make your country great, and it's more of a mind game. It's a very strategical game. Now, the, the issue, of course, is the competence to do, to do that and, and how you, from what premises you uh, proceed. But if you look back at 2000 and the things that he was saying in 2000 when he came to power and afterwards, obviously his main mission in life was to restore Russia's uh, power uh, to restore Russia's standing in the world and to restore Russia economically. And he was building everything incrementally up to this moment where he made this huge mis misjudgment that he would take Kiev and Ukraine within 72 hours or so. So that hasn't happened. He has to readjust his plans. But he will not, I, I think that he's the kind of person who'd rather die than accept defeat. So. We need to calculate that into everything. On the other hand, of course, we need to stand firm on the position that Ukraine has the right to self-defense, territorial integrity, sovereignty, et cetera, regardless of what, what Russia thinks of it, because ultimately Russia has recognized Ukraine. Um, however, I don't think an easy, I, I don't see an easy solution. Uh, I don't see an end to this very quickly because it's a huge territory that's been under occupation. So he is readjusting his plans and he will want a win-win situation. When I said that you, you have to come to Moscow prepared diplomatically, you actually have to discuss what the outcomes of those meetings would be so that it's, it is perceived as a win-win, otherwise you're going to be completely humiliated by them because they have the stage. And what scares me, you know, thinking about it strategically, I said that so many times, if I were him, I would stir trouble in other parts of the world. I mean, he's already set the precedent of changing borders by force. And in my own neighborhood in Southeast Europe, you hear voices from certain people that borders are not set in stone, that some people have the responsibility to denazify the region. So if I were him, where would I start trouble? Not on my own borders and not with a NATO member country because then you drag a NATO into a conflict that he cannot win. But you uh, provoke a crisis, for instance, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, in Kosovo, potentially even Montenegro, which, where we had already seen attempts at the destabilization. And, you know, one last point. I think that these, all of these um, uh, things that we hear in the media, in the public, oh, he's sick, he's going to go away, um, he's on steroids, he's all puffed up. I don't know. Maybe he's just used a little bit too much hyaluronic acid. So I wouldn't, or maybe they even want to push that misinformation so that we are acting from the false premises that he's going to go away. Um, even if he does, the uh, political military intelligence establ establishment is as such that he would be succeeded by another person just like him. So we must not make the same miscalculations because that would all be just wishful thinking.
Thank you. And, and I, I think one of the messages that comes, at least for me, in, in this conversation, these insights is as we go about managing the game or the, the, the game, the war, it's not a game, it's human life uh, of what's happening in Ukraine, we have to keep in mind Putin's mindset and set up a right strategy that, that probably pushes him to some extent, but also doesn't push him over the edge um, uh, and, and look at the rest of the world because it, it looks like the world is being recarved again, as it was. I want to thank you so much, Mr. President, Madam President, for being here. I wish we could have more time, and I appreciate your uh, attention as well. Thank you.